<laughs> seven feet. Seven feet. It's another opportunity for us to hear and learn of the word of truth as given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast and give him freely as a oh, gift to sense. all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues or a gift of prophecy, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, uh, to the saints watching in, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. Let's go to uh, John chapter 7, verse 14. What's today? The 26th? It's the 26th. So last week was... Last week was the... I don't know. The 19th. Go to what? This is John chapter 7, verse 14. <clears throat> All right, TJ. I can work. Now, about the midst of the feast, Yahushua went up into the temple and taught. All right, so Yahushua, he went into the temple and then he was teaching. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? All right, so they're like, How does he know the scriptures? And he's never learned, right? He's never been taught. He's never been, he's never been to a seminary. He's never, been, he's never been to the school, right? He didn't get his degree, right? So how, how, how does he know these scriptures and he's never learned? <laughs> if any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. Wait. And Yahshua answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Right, so he says, my doctrine isn't mine, but it's his that sent me. So he says, my doctrine, which y'all hear, and the stuff that I teach. Remember, doctrine is teach, teaching. So he says, my doctrine, which y'all hear, that's not mine. That's, that's the one that sent me. That's the Father, right? What did he say next? If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. All right, so he gives us the advice. He said, all we have to do is do his will. If we do his will, then we'll know whether it's of God or whether it's of itself. Right, we'll know if it's false doctrine. We can so we'll know if a man just comes speaking, making up his own stuff, as long as we do the will of God. All right, that's why we come here to learn the will of God that we might obey it. Uh, once we obey it, we we had a hope and we have uh, the faith that He increased our knowledge onto onto more obedience. But that's the that's the that's the uh, that has to be our focus. Our focus has to be constant obedience to the Most High God, knowing, understanding that everything that comes against us. It's just a challenge towards our obedience, right? And we'll never, it's a vicious cycle. We'll never understand the word if we never obey the word, if we never take it serious, if we never push, our, push ourselves to that, to that point of um, being righteous before the Most High God, whose name is Yah. Let's open up to uh, Acts chapter 26. We left off Acts chapter 26, verse 29. Left off Acts chapter 26, verse 29. <coughs> And Paul said, I wish to God that not only you, but also all that hear me this day were, bro were both almost and altogether such as I am. All right, so you remember uh, King Agrippa, he looked at him, he was like, man, you almost convinced me to be a darn Christian. You see Paul, he was careful, he was like, man, I wish to God, and all, everybody that would listen to me, you know what I'm saying, would end up being like me. You know what I'm saying, notice he didn't say Christian. Right, but he did say, I want everybody who look. I hope everybody was convinced, right? It would be good for everybody to be convinced, to be as I am. You know what I'm saying? Let's keep going. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor and Bernice, and they that sat with him. 
And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man does nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Right, so they admitted it. He's like, he didn't do anything worthy of death or of bonds. In other words, he didn't do anything worthy to be put to death, nor did he do anything worthy, worthy to be in jail. Right, so he, they're looking at different, different factors to say, I'm looking at the justice of the situation, and they can fairly admit that he didn't do anything wrong, or at least nothing wrong to the, to the point that he's being punished right now. Right? But watch what Paul said. And when, when he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor and Bernice, and they sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This uh, doeth nothing worthy of death or bonds, or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. All right? So, you know, liberty means freedom. All right? So he might have been set free if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Right, so you remember a couple chapters back, last week or the week before, we were reading, and remember, he kept on having to explain himself, and he had to show up for another person. First, he showed up in front of Festus, um, no, Felix, then Festus, right, then King Agrippa. So he had to show up before all these people and explain himself about how he really didn't do nothing wrong. And he told the, the same story or different parts of the story about his journey and how he went to the Gentiles, and now he's doing the work of the Most High God. And all these people looking at him like, well, I don't see what he did wrong. You know what I'm saying? But then eventually what he did is he appealed to Caesar. He was like, you know what? I keep telling you all this story. I want to talk to Caesar. I want Caesar himself to judge me. So Caesar is the emperor. That's the king, right? That's the man over. He's the king of kings, technically, right? He's the man over all of it. Agrippa is a king, but he got to report to Caesar, right? So Caesar's over everybody. You know what I'm saying? And so Caesar's over in Rome. So if you remember... He's saying right now, King Agrippa was like, well, honestly, I would have set your butt free. But you already appealed to, to Caesar. You know what I'm saying? So if you remember a couple chapters back, go to, um, go to uh, uh, Acts chapter uh, Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. 11. 2311. 2311. Yeah. It's Acts chapter 23, verse 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. Give me verse 10. Okay. And when there arose a great dissension, and uh, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down. So you remember, this is where Paul first got captured, right? All our, all our people, they, all the Hebrews, they got him, right? And they saw him. They caught him by the temple, and they started accusing him of all, this false, all these false accusations. So they got him, they gaffled him up, and they said the, uh, they, the, the testimony is that they was about to pull the man apart, right? So as they're trying to pull him apart, he's like, he's like, whoa, 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 right? The centurion guy, you know what I'm saying? The, the captain, he's looking at, hold on, you know what I'm saying? Let me stop this from going on. So he got Paul back and kind of rescued him in a sense, not because he wanted to save Paul, but because it's his job to keep order, all right? So this is what happened next. He commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force mm -hmm. from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. So the Paul. night following, the Most High God stood by him and he said, What? Be of good cheer, Paul. For as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so must you bear witness also at Rome. So the Most High God told Paul, he told him directly, he said, Be of good cheer. Because the same way you testified of me in Jerusalem... That's the same way that you're going to testify me, of me in Rome, right? So he's looking for him to go to Rome. So now it makes a little more sense. Why Paul was so quick, he is like, you know what? I, I just appeal to Caesar. Because Caesar, that's where he is in Rome, right? So all this was the most high God's plan, right? And it's not like it's something that Paul didn't really know, right? Some people get the impression that Paul didn't really know what he was doing. Like a lot of Christians, what they do, and it's not necessarily wrong what they do, but so a lot of Christians, what they'd do would be like, oh, see, Paul, he didn't know what was happening. God was just directing his life, this, that, and other. And in a sense, that's true, right? God was absolutely directing his life. But there was also some re responsibility on Paul because Paul knew these things, right? If you go back to Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, verse 21. This is Acts chapter 19, verse 21. After, That's what Paul said. After these things were ended, Paul proposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Acacia, uh -huh. Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. 
He said, I must also see what? <coughs> Rome. So he knew that the plan was to go to Rome already. Right? He is in the spirit. He is like, yeah, man, I propose in my spirit. I got to get to Jerusalem. But what's on his mind? I mean, I want to go to Jerusalem. But he said, after that, where am I going to go? I must also see Rome. Right? So then he went to Jerusalem. Remember, if you guys remember the timeline, he was on his way trying to get to Jerusalem, do everything he could to get to Jerusalem. The whole time he trying to get there, you remember the prophets showing him, they was like, man, the man who go there, he said, he snatched his belt off of him, wrapped his hands up, tied himself up. He was like, the man whose belt is on my hands right now, he go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to him. So they knew they had warned him, like, man, when you go to Jerusalem, your butt going to get put in jail, right? You're going to be bound up. You don't want to do that. Then they start crying over. They start crying like, man, don't go there. If you go there, we ain't going to never see you again, Paul. Paul was like, man, why are you breaking my heart? Not only will I go, I'm willing to die for this. Right? So Paul knew the plan. He already knew what was going on. So, yes, in a sense, God, not in a sense, absolutely God is directing Paul's life. But at the same time, God was, God was so transparent with a man like Paul that he told them this is the things that was going to happen. A lot of us, God has to direct our life. But he can't reveal too much. So it'll break it. Right? He, he revealed too much onto us too quick. We mess around and just fall and fall. I got to go through that. No, I'm not ready for that. Right? What happened when he revealed too much to Jonah? Jonah took a bell. He was like, no, nah, nah, we good. Right? Nineveh. I ain't going no darn Nineveh. You know what I'm saying? You don't believe. I already know what you're going to do. If I go to Nineveh, I'm going to preach to him. You're going to mess around and forget a butt. Them some filthy Gentiles. Right? And in a sense, you look at Jonah like he had the right idea. But what happened right after that? Not right after it, but a little bit after that. Right? Assyria came and took over the land. Remember, Jonah was from uh, northern Israel. Right? He's from the northern tribe. He looked like, man, we don't mess with him. Because he, he, he would have had to deal with him before Judah. Right? He was like, man, we don't mess with them people. He ain't going no darn Nineveh. He got in his butt in that bow. He was trying to get, get gone. Most high God came right after that butt, though. Put him through tri trials and tribulations. Right? He shook the boat up. Had to toss his butt out. Because the whole time he's trying to teach him, this is what I want you to do. That's the grace of the Most High God. Right? He's like, man, this is what I want you to do. He could have killed him. But he's like, no, I got something for you to do. Right? Just listen and hear me out. He had to teach him to un understand, his, uh, uh, understand his commandment and obey it. Right? And the Most High God know that. And the Most High God know I revealed too much on y'all too quick. Y'all mess around and just falter and break. Right? Paul's a man of God. He had, he, had the, he, had the, he had the concern of God in him, right? What God is concerned about, that's what Paul was concerned about. So the most high God could be more transparent with him. He could let him know, this is where I need you to go. That's why he knew. He's like, well, after I go to Jerusalem, I already know where I got to go. I'm going to Rome. And so now we start to see it all come to fruition, right? We, saw, we start to see that he talked to King Agrippa. All these people had the same opinion. Like, really, this man ain't do nothing wrong. King Agrippa would have the authority. Right, King Griff was like, well, I can, I can have this thing done. But you appealed to Caesar. Right, you ain't about to catch me slipping. You ain't about to get somebody tell them, talking about they appealed to Caesar and I didn't take them there. So uh, your butt got to go to Caesar. Remember, King Agrippa didn't even have nothing to do with the situation. Right, it was first Festus and then Felix or vice versa. Right, and they kept on inviting others to review it. Then when they, he appealed to Caesar, he was about to give them to Caesar. But then, uh, was it Felix? I think Felix was like, I don't even know what to write. He's like, what am I supposed to write to Caesar and tell him that what the problem is? I don't really know what the problem is because the man really ain't doing nothing. I don't know what they're arguing about. I don't even know what this is about. So King Agrippa was brought in because King Agrippa knew our people. He was around the area. He was very familiar with our traditions. So he's like, man, bring his buddy in. Why don't you hear the case? That way he can help out with writing something. So he heard it. Now that he heard it, he's like, well, really? I'd have set your butt free. But you appear to kill to Caesar. That's all the plan of the Most High God. And Paul knew the whole, the whole, the whole time. Right? It's very important that we see the plan of God and that we're, we're, we're at a point that we're willing to work within his plan without going outside his commandments. Right? It's a lot of ways. It's a lot of things you can see. Because the Most High God tell you, uh, Most High God tell you, by the end of this month, you're going to get a car. Right? And that, I mean, you clearly hear the voice of the Most High God. You might do some weird stuff to go get that car because you know you're supposed to get a car. And it's like, it's like, it's, 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 well, this may, but let's say it's June. By the end of June, you're going to get a car. How many days in June? 31? 30. 30? So, you know what I'm saying? It's June 28. You know what I'm saying? And you like, I still ain't got a car yet. But you know, you know the most high God 
said he going to give you a car. And all of a sudden, you're walking down the street, and you see a car with a, with a door open, brand new car, door open, title sitting right there on the, uh, on the seat, and a pen just sitting right there on the title, and then the keys right there in the ignition. You look at it, and you be like, there's my blessing. It's June 28th. The Lord told me he was going to give me a car. You get in that car, what you just do in reality? Steal it. You stole the car. But you looking at it, and you you know God told you you're going to get a car. Right? And the car right there, exactly how you, you know, just waiting there for you. You get in it, and you think you honestly think this is a blessing. But now you've obtained that without, without the ways of God because you've done it without was, was stealing. Nobody confirmed to you that was yours. Remember, this is the same God that wouldn't take his people. He owns the world. It's his world. He wouldn't take his people out of Egypt just by having them run away. He could have plagued the Egyptians and got them right out of Dodge. And it wouldn't have been an issue. But he, he plagued them to get Pharaoh to say go. Right? That's how God works. He going to give you a car. He going to give you a car. He going to have a man of God or, or some sinner give you an actual car. They going to sign off on it. You don't have to steal nothing. You ain't going to have to just take it upon yourself to say, you know what? I think that's what God gave me. Right? If you look at Paul, good example. If you look at Paul, and this is the reason why the Most High God can trust Paul. If you look at Paul, Abraham. huh? Or Abraham. That's a, that's the other side of it, right? So we're gonna do Abraham too. So you look at Paul, right? Paul was in a position where he was in jail and he was praying, and I think fasting, according to the book, right? So he was praying, and then all of a sudden it was an earthquake. All the cells opened up. Every one of them just opened up. Everybody in there could have been set free. The man that was keeping guard fell asleep. He woke up. He was like, oh, crap. All the cells open. He was about to kill himself because he knew what was going to happen to him if they found out he let all these people free. Then after that, Paul was like, no, nah, you, you know what I'm saying? No, nah, ain't nobody left. We all here. Because he knew nobody set him free. If I leave now, I've just unlawfully escaped from prison. I'm already in prison. For something that I'm not that I didn't do, but that don't give me a right under somebody else's authority to just walk out of here just because some doors open. But remember, this the man praying. No doubt his prayer was that you set me free, God. Right? We have to be able to see. Ah, that looked good, but that's not it. Right? Because if we don't see that, then we can fall into the wiles of the devil. We can fall into the trap. So much of this that we go through is an absolute trap. That was a trap for Paul. Right. And since he didn't fall for the trap, it ended up working out for God's glory. And the man who was keeping guard ended up giving his life over. Right. Changed his life. Repent. And that's what we look for. We look for those opportunities. Right. On the flip side of that, just like T mentioned, Abraham. Right. The most high God told him what happened. Most God, most high God told Abraham, you will have a son. He will be your heir to everything you got. And he was like, I'm old. My wife is barren. Is this going to be my heir. Is this by somebody else is going to be my heir. God told him no, right? But before that, he had a kid with his handmaid or his wife's handmaid, right? Mm -hmm. Had a kid with his wife's handmaid because... She is, a, uh, she is a servant. Right. And because they wanted a kid and he knew that guy was going to give him a kid, but he didn't think his actual wife was able to bear a child. So they took it upon themselves to have a baby through the handmaid. And that wasn't God's intention. Right? And you look at it, it made sense to them. Right? I'm a woman. Darn near 75 years old, something like that. She's on it. At that time, she's on it? I think so. Right? So I'm 175 to 100, somewhere in there. I'm old. Right? I'm a man. I'm old. No, oh, Abraham was on it. Right? I don't know how old she was. And so you look at them, they looking like, ain't no way. The most I got, as a matter of fact, the most I got told them. Right? Told them that they're going to have a kid. Like, you know what I'm saying? They, you know why they named him Isaac? Isaac mean laughter or something like that. They named him Isaac because she laughed. She was like, ain't no way I'm going to have no kids. She laughed at God. Right? So that was the understanding. Their understanding was, I'm super old. How is this going to happen? A while go on, they ain't got no kid. Most like God told them, you going to have a seed. Right? So they looking like, well, we do have a handmaiden. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Technically, she mine. So maybe that's the seed that the Most High God is talking about. Go ahead and go into it. That's what Sarah said. It. it was her decision. Go ahead and go into my handmaid. Right? The Abraham did it. You know what I'm saying? They had a son. Most High God said, no, that ain't the son. 
They ain't the one. Right? All because they went about it in a way outside of what the Most High God asked for. Right? They didn't know it. The Most High died. God didn't command them and say, do not, do not, uh, do not, you know what I'm saying, only, only do this with your wife. Right? Only move forward with your wife. That wasn't a commandment. There was no commandment at that time. Right? That's why it wasn't a sin. Right? If you look, the, the books say very clearly that Abraham kept all the law. Right? Everything the Most High God told him to do, he did. Right? But it still was outside of what God would have commanded. He didn't command it, but it, it's outside of what he would have commanded. In the book, go to um go to Romans chapter five. We're gonna try to bring this full circle. Abraham was good. This is Romans chapter five. Verse 11. Romans chapter 5, verse 11. Because if we did it today, you look at, I mean, you know what I'm saying? You got, you got a husband, you got a wife. A wife say, I got a servant, a female servant, right? I own her, right? It's my female servant, I own her, right? It's just, she a slave. Let's say, I own her. Right. Wife can't have babies. Husband is expecting a baby. Wife say, you know what? Go into my servant. Since I own her, technically, the child that comes out is my child. Right. Because I own the slave. Right. So he's saying, yeah, my husband go into my, my servant. That's what they did. Right. If we did that today and we look at it for us that are believers in the word, what is that for us? That would be adultery. That thing is adultery, period. I don't care what the wife give us consent to. Type of freaky deep stuff y'all got going on. That thing adultery. Period. That thing done. Right? Was it adultery for Abraham? No. This is Romans chapter 5. That thing could be confusing. Be like, well, if, it, if it's adultery for us, why wasn't it adultery for Abraham? I'll show you because the, the most high God word is perfect. That's why. Romans chapter. But there's no law. There's no sin imputed. That's right. That's what you're about to read right now. Romans chapter 5, verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Yahushua, the Messiah, by whom we have now received the atonement. Uh huh. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all that have sinned. Uh huh. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Right? So he said, until the law, sin was in the world. So he said, even before the law, he said, until the law. So he said, even before the law, there was sin in the world, but sin is not, I mean, yeah, sin is not imputed. In other words, sin, nobody's charged with sin if there's no law. So he's saying the sin was actually there, right? But a person can't be charged with it if there's no law. In other words, if I never told you it was wrong and you do it, then I can't charge you and say you did something wrong. And that's where the most high God was. Technically, what Abraham did was wrong. But it wasn't a sin for him because the Most High God hadn't given him a commandment saying, do not, right? Or do this or don't do this, right? That's why if you go to uh, Genesis chapter 26, maybe verse uh, 6, maybe 8, maybe 4. I don't know. Let's try 6. We meet in the middle. Genesis 26. Genesis 26, verse 4, verse 6. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Yep, that's six. Yeah. yeah, that's it. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. So this is, this is Isaac, right? What did you say about Isaac's daddy? And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say, she is my wife. That's 26? Yeah. Is that what I'm looking for? I don't think so. Keep going. What verse 8 say? You want verse 3. 3? Oh, okay. This is, uh, give me... It's three that I want, or I want before that. You want five, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes and my law. Yeah, give me five then. You know what I'm saying? This is, this is Genesis chapter 26, verse five. Let's do four. It's Genesis chapter 26, verse four. And I will make your seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto your seed all these countries. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Right? Because that Abraham 
Abraham obeyed my voice. So Abraham obeyed. It's God talking. Abraham obeyed his voice. And kept my charge. He kept his charge. My commandments. His commandments. My statutes. His statutes. And my laws. And his laws. Right? So this is the word of, this is the, word of the most I got. He testifying this after Abraham's death. So it ain't like. It ain't like it ain't like it's something else that happened afterwards. Like, yeah, he kept him for a while and then he stopped. Now, this after he died, his final assessment of Abraham was this man kept my laws. He obeyed my voice. He kept my statutes. He obeyed my charge. He this man did what I said. Right. So everything that the most High God gave to Abraham, he walked in. it. If it was revealed to Abraham, he walked in it just like Paul. It was revealed to Paul. You're going to go to Rome. And you're going to have to testify. It wasn't like Paul was going to be like, oh, no, I don't know if I want to go to Jerusalem now. It was revealed to him. He knew what he had to do. So he was like, all right, for sure. And he walked in it. That's how Abraham was, right? He walked in what was given. However, what wasn't given to him is that he shouldn't commit adultery, right? That was not given to him. In fact, it wasn't given in our law, right? When Moses gave us the law, that wasn't, it was not, it, adultery was given to us. But it wasn't given to us that a man can't have more than one wife, right? That came when Yahushua made that a commandment, right? He came in and Yahushua, he told, uh, grab Matthew. Matthew chapter 19. In the beginning, it was not so. It's Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. All right, the Pharisees asked him a question. We're going to read with the question. Because a lot of times you'll look at it and you'll see how did these things progress? Right. If God is the same today as he was yesterday, you know, what I'm saying how are the laws going to change. All right. Well, the laws change because it's a different one bringing them. All right. When the most high God was dealing with Abraham, he gave him laws directly. And he told him in the beginning, this is how it was. Yeah. You know? Then if you look at if you look at Moses, you know, what I'm saying when he gave us law, he gave us laws. He gave them to Moses. Then Yahushua will come and he gonna he give us law. All right, he give us uh something to obey. All right, so that's how it's different because it's different people bringing them. The most high God gave different information at different times to reveal different things. All right? But without the law, then there's no sin in, uh, imputed. So now as each time more things are revealed about what is wrong and what isn't wrong. All right, what can be done and what can't be done. If I didn't come into the world, you'd have no. Right. And that's what we look at. Right. He comes to reveal. Right. To shed light on where there once was darkness. All right. <clears throat> this is Matthew chapter 19, verse three. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Right. So they ask a the question. Is it lawful for I mean, just for any reason for a man to just put away his wife? All right. Let's see. And he answered and said unto them, have you not read? That he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. Right? So he said, so he killed a whole lot of stuff right here. He said, when he made them at the beginning, he made them male and female. All this gender stuff that they be trying to, you know what I'm saying, I'm, a, I'm gender, you know what I'm saying, I can be whatever gender I want, that's their mind. They can do whatever they want to do. That's their mind. That stuff sin, though. I don't care what you're talking about. That stuff a darn sin. You can do whatever you want to do. Enjoy what you want to enjoy. I just want you to know, that thing sin. Your butt going to darn hell. Right? Keep going. So he said he made a male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Right. His wives and to his wife. Nah, his wives is what it say. The, the new Hebrew uh, multiple wives version, the polygamy version, say his wives with an S. You know what I'm saying? V.E.S. at the end. What is that? And shall cleave to his wife. That's one. You know what I'm saying? What, as a matter of fact, I mean, just so we don't make a mistake. What does it say next? And they twain shall be one flesh. Just so we know that the translators didn't do it wrong. Maybe, maybe the translator misinterpreted wife and they meant wife. So let's try to read it that way. The two shall become one flesh. The twain shall become one flesh. Does that work with wives? No. You got at least three. If you got wives. You got a husband and you got wives. You got at least three. How the twain going to become one flesh? Right? That's not book. All right, so that's how just from right there he instituted this law. All right, he said it was like this from the beginning. He said this law. This is what the Most High God gave from the beginning. But that ain't it. This is another part that they missed. Keep going. Therefore, 
They are no more twain, but one flesh. They one flesh. They no more twain. Twain means two. Mm -hmm. All right? So they no more two. They're one flesh. Keep going. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. All right? So he said don't put them asunder. In other words, don't divorce them. What, watch, watch what they say next. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Right? So they're looking like that's in our law that Moses gave a writing of divorcement. That's facts. It's in our law. Watch what he said. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. Mm -hmm. But from the beginning it was not so. Mm -hmm. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for her fornication, for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery. And right? whosoever marries her, which is put away, does commit adultery. Right. So he said anybody who put away their wife for any reason other than fornication, and gets another one, it's adultery. So when he say fornication, a lot of people, like this thing used to have me hung up too. I used to be like, so what? Why does he say fornication and not adultery? Because what you're thinking of, you like, I'm married. If my wife sleeps around and I'm married, that's not fornication, that's adultery, right? Right? So he's like, if you put her away for any reason other than fornication, that thing never made sense. But then we kind of, you know, we kind of, even though we know it don't make sense, what we do is we kind of reason. So it's like, oh, well, really, that mean adultery right there. It's just they mean the same thing. Fornication is interchangeable. You can use it for either one of them. That's the kind of silliness that, you know, we use to settle the contradiction in our mind, knowing that our understanding contradicts what's, what's, what's written, right? But if we knew the law, if I would have knew the law back then, I wouldn't have had to try to reason. I would have understood exactly what he's saying. The law, if you read that exact law when Moses said it, he said you could put your wife away for uncleanness, Right? And then the law tell us that if a woman is, 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 you know, is supposed to be a virgin and then we find out when we get married that she's not a virgin, right, she's to be stoned. But then the other option is to privately put her away. That's what Joseph was going to do, right? When Joseph <coughs> saw that Mary, you know what I'm saying, when that Mary was pregnant and he knew he didn't sleep with her, he was about to privately put her away. So that's what it's talking about, because if she slept with somebody before they were married, then that would have been fornication. That wouldn't have been adultery. So he's putting her away because she slept with somebody before they got married, and he was expecting her to be a virgin. Like uh, if someone was engaged today. If somebody was engaged today and they got, they, got, they got married and they were expecting their wife to be a virgin or expecting the husband to be a virgin, right, then we find out that that's not the case and they weren't a virgin, without being the, expect, the expectation, then it would be lawful to divorce under those, that, that context. Now, you didn't expect there to be a very lot of y'all trying to get out of y'all, you know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, well, my wife wasn't a virgin when we got married, so therefore I can divorce her. Now, that thing don't count. You full well married or knowing that, right? Your butt wasn't either, you know what I'm saying? Y'all y'all, y'all got to that thing knowing, full well knowing. All right, we talking about virgins where, you know what I'm saying, you had to have the token, you know what I'm saying? You had that, you know what I'm saying, you had the token, you had the proof that she was a virgin. You know what I'm saying? That's what that's what that's what the book is talking about. He says under under that context, then you could put her away. But notice what he say after that. All right? He said he said I don't, well go ahead and read it for me. I don't know what verse. I say, you whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, uh -huh. and shall marry another, commits adultery. And shall adultery, do what? And shall marry another, commits adultery. So now listen to what now. Just try to make this understand. Let's just say that you can have multiple wives. Let's say, nah, brother got two wives, right? Then one wife, he finds out, is not a virgin, right? He already has two wives. One of his wives, he found out, wasn't a virgin when he married her. So he puts her away, right? Or let's, say, let's just say he, let's say he just, let's say he puts her away anyway. Dude. Let's say he puts her away anyway, right? <coughs> He puts her away for whatever reason he feels like putting her away. He's just tired of it. He put her away. The book said he committed adultery if he marries another wife. So what, what, what people are looking at is you're saying it's lawful to have two wives. It's lawful to have three wives. It's lawful to have four wives. But if you divorce one, you can't have no more wives? That don't make sense. What he's saying is you have one wife. And if you divorce her and marry another one, that's adultery. So if you get another wife and you don't divorce her, that's adultery. You married another one. 
right? A lot of people don't like to don't like to look at it, and they're like, no, nah, the book don't say that. Like it's a New Testament theme, and like you know what I'm saying? That's that's something that only the book say. Book been saying the same thing for years, right? Proverbs five. It's Proverbs chapter five, verse fifteen. Book been saying the same thing for years. It's just that our law, the confusion comes in because our law, not just allowed, right? Christians would like to say, well, God, you know, he just didn't, he turned his head when it was happening, but he never honored it. And all that, so that's a lie. He honored that thing. He even offered some of the kings most of the while. Yeah, he told David, you could have as many. Why could have any wife you wanted? What you talking about? He offered the king multiple wives, right? Because that thing wouldn't have sinned for there. He didn't command it. He didn't tell them, you, thou shalt not. When it, came, when it came to concerning uh, multiple wives, he didn't tell you you get another when you could commit an adultery. Right? For us, it was adultery if we slept with another man's wife. Right? It wasn't adultery for us to have multiple wives. Because that wasn't a commandment. That didn't become the commandment until y'all was sure. But it wasn't like it wasn't spoke about. It wasn't like the idea wasn't out there. Watch it. This is Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15. Drink waters. Out of thine own cistern. He said, drink waters out of th thine own cistern. A cistern is like, like, a, like a well. You know what I'm saying? So he said, drink waters out of your own well. And running waters out of your own well. Right, so it's cistern and well, similar ideas. That's why I use them both like that. So he said, drink the running waters out of your own well. Watch what he say next. Let your fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of water in the streets. Right? So when he says drink the water, now he says let your fountains be dispersed. In other words, he's talking about the seed, the offspring, right? So he's now he said now he says he's using a parable. He says drink the drink from your own well. In other words, you got you got your well. You drink from your own. Don't be looking for everybody else's, right? Why? Well, keep going. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of water in the streets. Mm -hmm. Let them be only your own and not strangers with thee. Right? He said only your own, not strangers with thee. So far, you could look at it and be like, well, it could be talking about multiple, right? Or we don't even know. It's just talking about water. It ain't talking about nothing about why. Let's see. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. The, the wives of your youth? The wife of your youth. You better drink from your own fountain, boy. The wife of your youth, right? The wife of the youth. What, what's another way of saying wife of your youth? Wife of your <laughs> wife is why you're young. Your first wife. <laughs> right? Your only wife. The one you married first. The one that you married when you was young. He said, that, he said let that thing. He man, you drink from your own fountain, boy. Stop messing with all these darn fountains. You ain't got no business playing around with these fountains. He said, drink from your own fountain. What up? Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. Right? He said, that's what you do. You have one wife. Drink from your own fountain. Right? That thing ain't a new car. Go to Malachi. This is Malachi chapter 2. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? All right? This is what Malachi chapter 2 say. All this multiple wives stuff, these people we talking about, it was just, it's a sister that know this stuff, man. Know this. I know she know it. You know what I'm saying? She hang out with these, these stupid Hebrews. You know what I'm saying? I was trying to tell her, she's trying to explain to her, you know what I'm saying? I'm falling into that stuff because they, they pressuring you and that, that weird stuff that they own, talking about multiple wives, that polygamous stuff. She's going to post a video. First of all, this is the same girl. She be Gentile, this and Gentile, these wicked Gentile. She's going to post a, vi a video. Of a man with two girlfriends having babies by both of them and all of them happily living together. And she just sitting there saying, she said goals on it. I said, you must be sick and out of your darn mind. Just sick. Oh, that's wickedness. Gentile wickedness. You know what I'm saying? You, you can condemn Christmas. I'd rather you celebrate Christmas do that foolishness. That's what don't make no darn sense. Y'all condemn all this stuff and then fall into the same hypocrisy. Same hypocrisy. Whole book trying to tell you. It's New Testament. I mean, I, I can give it to you in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's more clear in the New Old Testament. How you want it? Out of your cardio. You know what I'm saying? Look at this. This is uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse uh, 
what I want, 15, 16, 14, 14, 14. It's Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. Yet you say, why? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. The wife, look, this is the same thing the Proverbs told us. He said, the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your what? Your youth. That's your first wife. Well, let's see what else happened. Against whom you have dealt treacherously. How could you betray your first wife? By getting another one. Yet is she your companion and the wife of your covenant. He's, she, that's the wife of your what? Covenant. That's the agreement you made. Why you ain't got multiple covenants? Why you didn't say multiple covenants? Because you talking about one wife. Watch what you say. And did not he make one? Did not he make one? In other words, did not make y'all one? Didn't the two become one flesh? Don't all this sound familiar? Keep going. Yet had he the residue of the spirit. He said, yet, in other words, the most high God saying, I had a spirit. Look, it ain't like I ran out of spirit. I could have made y'all as many as I want. He said, but I made y'all one. And I could have did, I could have made a whole lot more, but I made y'all one. Keep going. And why one? That he might seek a godly seed. See, if you look at it, it's saying the same thing that we read in Proverbs. Proverbs is like, man, you better drink from your own darn cistern. All right? You better get refreshed from your own darn well. And let your fountains go flowing all through the, uh, the streets. That's talking about a seed. Let your kid, you have you a bunch of kids. Right? Do your thing. Have you a bunch of kids, let them run out into the darn street. He said, don't be messing with none of them strangers, though. I'm doing none of that stuff with them darn strangers. Don't be treacherous to the wife of your youth. You can't have more than one wife. You can't divorce and get remarried. You can't do none of that stuff. That stuff don't make no darn sense. All right? Only, the only condition is husband or wife die, you know what I'm saying, and you can lawfully get remarried. All right? You even got booked, though. You even got booked talking about the widows, though. You know what I'm saying? Paul gave advice to, uh, I think it was Timothy. I can't remember exactly where it is. Paul gave advice to uh, one of either Titus or Timothy in the book of Titus or Timothy. He gave advice saying, even if the widow get remarried, he said, don't even include her. I think they are talking about uh, uh, I think they are talking about the uh, what are they talking about? I think they are talking about you know what I'm saying taking care of the widows. Either that widow, you know what I'm saying, she is, if she's a widow and she has a husband, one one husband, he said, good. If she get remarried, he said, don't even include her. You know what I'm saying? If she had two husbands. Don't even include. Let's say it's both her husband died. She had two. He said, no, don't even include. One husband. Right? And that's lawful for her. It just see that it changes. It's not that she committed a sin. You know what I'm saying? It just changes the outlook of things. You gotta have one. Right? You a man of God, you wanna, you wanna be uh, you wanna preach the word and all that. Even if your wife died, you can't get another one. Not and pre not not and be a, a, a bishop over the word. You you stuck. You got to be a husband of one wife, not one wife at a time, one wife, period. That's what the book says. So if you do get another wife, you got to step down. You got to step down. You can have one. It ain't a sin for you, right? Yeah. You just can't lead, a, you can't lead the congregation, though, right? It ain't saying you can't teach. You can teach. You just got to teach that thing on the side. You can't have the authority, all right? You can't have the overall authority of the, of the congregation. Somebody else got to have that, right? Because that's book. We can't do, you know what I'm saying? We can't cut around the rule. We can't pretend like the only, <coughs> the only prohibition is against women preaching. Please, we got rules. We gotta, we make, you gotta make sure we follow them things. You know what I'm saying? We got rule. All this stuff got rules. What they say is levels to this. That's what a kid be saying. It's levels to this. That's what they be saying. You know what I'm saying? Kids be telling. I be saying, you know, I'm hip. It's levels to this. You come to this book and it's levels to this. You can't just walk in here trying to do what you want to do. But sit your butt down, Cora. Grab uh, Luke, Luke chapter 17. Watch what Luke say. It's Luke chapter 17, verse 34. All right, because you look at it, you look at the difference between, between Abraham and between Paul and how they reacted to the situation. All right? Paul when he saw that all the, the sails opened up after the earthquake and the man been praying, probably praying, Lord, please free me out of here. I didn't do nothing wrong, Lord. Please get me out of here. He get done praying, all the gates, all the sales doors open up and he's free to go. He can just walk right out. Guard is asleep. He can just go right out. But he stayed there because he knew, most high God didn't tell me to leave. 
the guard who has the authority didn't tell me to leave. So why am I trying to leave again? Right? He's submitting to the authority that's there. Even if he know it's unlawful for him to be there. That's a man of God. A lot of people call that stuff weak and scary and all that stuff. No, no, no. That's a man of God. That's a man that cares about the honor from God more than he cares about what people view him as or how he view himself. Right? That's how we got to look at ourselves. Right? I was wrong about something the other day. I had told somebody something, you know what I'm saying? I was, I was incorrect about it. So then all last night and today I was thinking about that thing. You know what I'm saying? I came and talked to Tasha about it and I thought about it and I was like, you know what? That thing ain't right. So I went in the book, prayed a little bit, tried to make sure I got a good understanding of it. Then I had to go back and let them know. Like, you know what? What I was talking about last night, that thing was wrong. You know what I'm saying? That thing was wrong. Here's actually the correct version of what I said. This is why I was wrong, but this is correct. You know what I'm saying? This is the information. This is what I would use against myself if I was arguing myself because this is the book. This is more clear. Sorry about that. I apologize. They response to me was, that's crazy that you needed the Bible to tell you that that was wrong. Because they was looking at it. It was obvious that it was wrong for them, and they don't believe the Bible. It's like, it's crazy that you need the Bible to tell you. I was like, I feel you, but it's a whole lot of crazy. I was like, I agree. But that's a whole lot of crazy stuff I believed until I, I, I read the Bible. I was like, honestly, it's a whole lot of crazy stuff you believe right now. And if you read the Bible, you'll find out it's crazy for you to believe. So I appreciate the most I got. Right? I think her, tell, her telling me it's crazy. That thing don't bother me. You're right. That thing is definitely crazy. Crazy I need the Bible to, to understand that. Absolutely crazy. I believe a whole lot of crazy stuff. Believe a whole lot of crazy until the book comes. Because I'm not looking for honor from any of these people. My honor only comes from God. If I was looking for honor now, I'm going to save faith. I'm going to be, no, nah, I was right still. That's not what I meant. You took it wrong. Try to change up my argument. Because I'm still looking. I don't want people to see me as wrong or as a flip flop. I don't care nothing about none of that stuff. At the end of the day, I got to be right. And I got to be right not for the sense of bragging rights. I got to be right because the most high God got to judge at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, it ain't just I got to be right and keep it to myself. If I told you something wrong, I got to go back and apologize. And I got to make it right. Right? This is not a game. It's not something that we sit here and just plan. Everything has to be done appropriately. It has to be done appropriately. If not, we risk way too much giving bad information, letting people run around with it, and then we misrepresent God. That's going to fall on our account. Right? Most high God could never look at me if that was my attitude. He could never look at me and at the end of my death tell my son he obeyed everything I said. You know how powerful that I got to feel? To have, have the most high God tell your son that you obeyed every word of his commandment? I love that. I love that. That's glory from God. That ain't glory from no man. Ain't nobody telling nobody that. I don't care nothing if T, if, if T say, man, Philip, obey everything that God say. That thing nice. I appreciate you. That thing nice. Most high God say it, though? That's where I do it, folks. I ain't trying to convince T. I think T, T got it. Just, he just got to see it or he don't. Right? I'm trying to be encouraged by T. I ain't trying to convince him. Right? I'm trying to see T right here with me so it can encourage me to keep going. I'm not trying to convince him, though. You know what I'm saying? Not that of my right. I'm trying to convince everybody of what the books say. I ain't trying to convince nobody of my righteousness. How good I am. That thing don't make no sense. I'm trying to convince you that most high God is good. Right? But that's the difference. You see, you see Abraham using limited information. He jumped out the darn window. He's like, yeah, uh, yeah, you right, baby. You know what I'm saying? Let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and have this baby. It's just a difference. It's two people. You can put two people in the exact same situation. Right? You can put two people in that jail cell with Paul, right? That exact same situation. They praying to God. You take a Christian today, you let them get put in jail. You just let they but get put in jail for something they didn't really do. And let's just say they put them in jail just because they're a Christian. You got a Muslim that put a Christian in jail just because they're a Christian. And the, the cell doors open up on them, they but getting out of die. They scooting out of that thing so you ain't never seen nothing go fast in the darn pew. They out of there. Shoom. They leave them darn dust trails, smoke. You know what I'm saying? You know how the cartoons, they start running, they run themselves, they can't even go. I thought the Christian go. They couldn't run and play trying to go pew out of there. Right? Because they looking at it, the most high God answered my prayer. They praising God all the way out of there. Really, they just committed a crime. At first, they didn't commit a crime. 
Now they really committed a crime. Right? But Paul had a different mindset. Same exact situation, but how did we react to what God gave us? <coughs> right? Abraham, same thing. Abraham with limited information, even though he didn't sin, it would have been a sin if it were done, done today. Right? So we look at it, Abraham with the exact situation. Somebody else could look at it and be like, you know, well, actually, Abraham got to put, be put in a situation twice. Right? But the Most High God taught him through that. He showed him, he was like, no, nah, we'll get to it. Grab, grab Luke chapter 17. Let me show y'all two different situations. It's Luke chapter 17, verse 34. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. They're going to be who? Two men in one bed. Two men, and they're going to be in one bed. Watch this. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. He's trying to let you know it's two people in the same situation. One of them going to get taken. The other buddy is going to be sitting there. What else going to happen? Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women going to be in the field. They grinding. They trying to get the, 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 uh, the, uh, the bread. You know what I'm saying? You got to grind the bread down or the, the wheat down to make bread. Two women, they grinding, helping each other out. Then all of a sudden, what else? One shall be taken and the other left. Same situation. Different, different circumstances for them, though, because it's all based off of our actions. How did we handle our situations? Right? Grab, um, grab, uh, grab uh, Matthew chapter 13. We're going to get the parable of the wheat and the tear. Same thing. Uh, uh, 13? Yeah. It's Matthew chapter 13. find ourselves in the same situation everything looked the same but it's all about our reaction it's gonna read we're gonna read about the weed and the tears uh matthew chapter 13 verse 25 it's the explanation of the weed and the tears we'll start at 24 all right another parable he put forth unto them saying the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sows good seed in his field uh-huh but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Right? So what y'all so tares, long time ago, I think a couple years ago, we looked at pictures of wheat and tare. So tare and wheat look almost identical as as they grow, as they grow. You know what I'm saying? It's not until they become ripe where they're ready to, you know what I'm saying, ready to actually be picked that they look different. So tares. They are going to grow green, right? Going to start off green. Wheat, start off green, right? Then they continue to grow. The wheat actually has kernels on it. You know what I'm saying? It has like little, uh, it has like pretty much seeds. You know what I'm saying? But it has grain on it. So the grain weighs the wheat down. You know what I'm saying? So the wheat is going to end up bending over and start to kind of fall over. The tares don't really have anything on them. You know what I'm saying? So the tares are going to pretty much grow up straight for the most part, Right? And then the wheat going to turn into a, a like a blonde brown color. You know what I'm saying? The tares, not so much. They're going to change color, but not as much as the wheat. So then if you let them grow, you know what I'm saying? You'll see the difference. So watch this. He said that in the parable, he said that there was wheat and then an enemy came and started sowing tares in there. So they started planting tares with the wheat, knowing that they looked the same for a while. Watch this. But when the, ta but when the blade was sprung, it was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Right? So he's saying when the blade was sprung. So in other words, the, the, the actual wheat, when it sprung and you could see it, like, rearing his head up, he saw the, t the tares rearing their head up too. So some people could look at them and be like, oh, that's a tear. That ain't a wheat. Even though they look similar, they could tell, like, no, that's a tear. That's not a wheat. But watch. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did not thou sow good seed in your field? Mm -hmm. From where then has it tears? Right, he said, we sold good seed. So where'd the tears come from? Let's see. He said unto them, an enemy has done this. Uh-huh. The servant said unto him, Will, do you want us that we go and gather them up? All right, so he said, we can go get all the tears right now. All right, but watch what he said. But he said, no, unless while you gather up the tears, you root up also the wheat with them. He said, you might have accidentally root up the wheat. Getting some of the tear, because they look so much alike. You'd be looking at them like, no, nah, I think that's a tear. You take it up, and it end up being a wheat. He's like, no, no, no. What do you say? What's his solution? 
All right, watch out. Watch out. He do it. He said, yeah, I want to do it a little differently. Don't go get them right now. Wait for it. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather, gather ye together first the tares and bind them up bundles to burn them. Mm -hmm. But gather the wheat into my barn. All right. So you look at it. He said, after they grow when it's time for harvest, remember, after they grow, they start to bend over because the, 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 the uh, grain is weighing them down. Right, so they start. They grow up like this, then they start to bend over because the grain starts weighing them down as they grow. The the tear, they gonna pretty much for the most part grow straight up, right? So it's easy to see the difference at that point. You just go through and be like, ah, that's a tear, that's a tear, that's a tear, and then you can separate them. Same situation, right? They're just a different about how they react to the situation, right? The bad seed reacted; they were tear, so they didn't react the same way that the good seed reacted. That's the same thing we all. We can be in the same situation, same opportunity there, but we get it. That car, right? That car, the door wide open, you know what I'm saying? Got the title on the seat, engine, I mean, uh, keys in the ignition. You know what I'm saying? That thing looks nice and pretty. Guy told you that you was going to get a car by the end of the month. That thing right there, man, a guy look at it and be like, let me keep going. Or let me talk to you, let me find out who owned it and see what's going on here. Man, a guy look and be like, is this your car? Yes, yeah, sir, this is my car. I'm trying to give it away for free. Let me sign that title for you. Right? A man that's not learned, he'll ignorantly get in the car and be like, you know what? This must be God's blessing for me. Sign the title himself, drive off on it, and they report it stolen. Right? Same situation they was in, handled completely different. One is going to be of God. The other way, it's not going to be of God. Sometimes it's not always absolutely clear and obvious when God has something in front of you, right? The only thing that's clear for us is the word, making sure that we obey the word, right? Anything outside of that, we'll mess around and get ourselves messed up. This is Zechariah chapter 13. Watch this. This is why God put us in those situations. Just like, just like that, that parable of the wheat and the tear, he put us and allow us to grow. He puts us there. And grow. Don't pick nobody out. Don't pick nobody out until we get to the heart. Right? So he knows there's evil and good growing right together. And he said, no, no, no. Hold off before we get to start picking stuff off. That's why we're here. A lot of people are like, why are we still here? Why don't this? Because God knows it's evil and good. And some people still got to grow. Right? Some people that started off looking like a tear, they're going to end up looking like wheat. He said, don't pick them too soon. That's grace. That's the grace of God. You look at it, that thing, he told him, man, he said, man, don't pick them yet unless you mess around and grab a wheat. Because you'll be thinking you're grabbing a tear. They look alike. Right? Be like, no, nah, I'm grabbing all these tear. I ain't no wheat. That thing look alike, though. You mess around and grab a wheat and you stop a wheat from growing. Most like God better than that. He said, nah, you all right. We're going we gonna to harvest them when they all grown. That's why we here. That's why, we, that's why all this evil go on and the Most High God ain't come back to rescue. Because there's still some people out there that look like tares, and they're going to turn into wheat. They look like tares, though. They start off evil, look bad, look wrong, just like all of us did. But we grow, and we grow into men and women of God. Right? That's the grace of God, teaching us righteousness. Right? Keep going. This is, uh, this is uh, Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Watch how he teach us. Watch how he, watch how he weed stuff out. Awake, O sword, mm -hmm. against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, says the Lord of hosts. Who is he talking about? Yahushua. Yahushua. He said, awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Talking about Yahushua. He said, against my fellow. All right? Keep going. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. What are you talking about? And I will and one. What? He said, smite the shepherd and then the sheep going to be scattered. What happened after Yahushua got, when he, when he was smitten? Disciples ran. Disciples spread out, didn't they? He told him, he, <coughs> said, he said, don't go nowhere until, uh, until the, the spirit comes to Jerusalem. This night, y'all going to be all going to be made offended because of me. Right? He went, he went, and then the spirit came to Jerusalem. After that, pew, everybody spread. Everybody went out. They went to Damascus. Some of them went to uh, Caesarea. You know what I'm saying? Paul went all over the place. So everybody spread at that point, right? And then more specifically, when they smote him um, after, uh, after uh, Judas betrayed him, all of them ran. Peter got out of Dodge. All of them got out of Dodge. 
Right? They look like we ain't about to get caught up in this mess. Right? Then after that, the book say what? He going to turn his hand where? Upon the little one. He said he going to turn his hand upon the little one. That means after the pressure is applied to Yahushua, now the pressure about to be applied to the disciples. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw all the suffering. We saw all the disciples dying, going to jail, all these things. Because he said after I smite him, it, the, part, the pressure is going to be applied to the disciples. Watch what he say next. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, says the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, for the third shall be left therein. All right? So he said the land, imagine a land being three parts. He said two of those parts going to get cut off and they're going to die. When did we see that happen? Rome. Rome. Rome invaded Israel. Right? Killed two-thirds of our people. He said, but a third of them, what's going to happen? The third part. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. He said the third part, they're going to go through the fire. Does that mean all of them make it? No, he said I'm going to refine them like what? Gold and silver. So when you're dealing with gold, so when, when they, they refine gold, what they do is they take gold, they dig it out of the ground or whatever, all right, and then they put it in blazing hot fire and they try to put it in a, in a temperature that will melt the gold. You know what I'm saying? And then sometimes they add stuff into it or whatever. But what they want to do is they want to melt the gold because they want to see what is going to burn before the gold burns. Right? Before the gold melts, what's going to melt before that? Because I know if it melts before gold melts, it's just like water. Right? If I take water and I, I lower the temperature, lower and lower, and it freeze, I know that's the exact temperature that water freezes. So now if you put alcohol, right, some clear, like some vodka or something, right, you take some vodka and you put it under that same temperature, it's not going to freeze. That will tell you that this is not water, right? If I don't know which is water, which is not, I can't smell it, can't do nothing, only way I can test it is to bring it to a low temperature. If I bring it to low temperature, this one freeze and this one don't, it tells me this one's water. And what, what water freeze at? 30 degrees? I think it's 30 degrees, right? So at 30 degrees, the water going to freeze, and then the, uh, the alcohol, the vodka, is not. They both clear. They both look like water, but one of them not because it's not freezing. Same thing with gold. You bring it to a certain temperature, that thing going to melt. So you bring it up, and you try to burn it because you want, you want pure gold. So anything that's not gold that's mixed with it, that it ought to be burned up or it should be melted before I get to the level where the gold melts. Then you can separate it. So you're getting all the impurities out of it. And that's what they call purifying gold. Right? So that's what he's talking about. He is like, I'm a, the third, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to take three parts. These two, getting rid of their butt. They done. Right? This third part, though, I'm taking them through the fire. So what he's doing is he's still getting rid of a lot of, a lot of people in this third. Right? But I only want the pure. Right? Only those that are pure. So that's what he's talking about when he said it's going to be two people in the field. One going to be out of there, right? I'm letting the wheat grow with the tares. We getting them tares out of there because he's taking only the pure. That's why you have to be in a position where if that car is sitting in front of you and the most high God promised that to you and you looking like this is my car, the most high God, you have to be pure. You have to be able to handle that situation correctly. That's not your car. Not until somebody tell you it's your car. Yeah, you may not feel like a boss. The only reason you want to feel like a boss and be able to walk up and drive off in it because it's your car because you're looking for the honor of men. You're looking for the honor of God. That thing don't matter. It's okay. Yes, master. Thank you for the car, master. I'm out of here. If that's your master. Right? You ain't got no time to be sitting here sitting here looking for pride. Oh, no, ain't nobody my boss. I'm the boss. I run the show. Yeah, okay. You run whatever you darn want to run. You're going to run yourself right to darn hell. Right? That's what we look at. Huh? Half of them don't even be the boss of nothing. No, I ain't the boss. Ain't none of you do the boss of nothing. They lost their darn mind. All the, ain't none of them the boss. Ain't going to be a boss you got brought over here as slave. They still ain't apologized. Where are you going to be a boss of anything in this country? It don't even make no darn sense. You a supervisor at best. At best. You know what I'm saying? A manager at best. You know what I'm saying? Ain't no boss of nothing. None of them. None of them. Hey, all of them going to have somebody that they, they behind the scenes paying. Behind the scenes paying them, I mean. You know what I'm saying? Ain't boss of nothing. Running your darn mouth. It's Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 14. 
try to bring it back to Abraham. It's Romans chapter 4, verse 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, mm -hmm. and the promise made of none effect. Mm -hmm. Because the law works wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Right, so this is what we read earlier. You know what I'm saying? No sin is imputed when there's no law. So he's saying the same thing. If there's no law, there's no transgression. Keep going. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. He said, it is a faith that it might be by what? By grace. By grace. I told y'all that was grace that, that led Abraham. Watch what he said. To the end, the promise might be sure of to all the seed, not to that which only is of the law, but to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Right? So you're looking like Abraham, the father of us all. We have to take out the Abraham. Right? It's not, it's not, it's intentional that the most high God didn't reveal unto Abraham that that it was a sin, right, to to uh to sleep with uh sleep with the other woman. Right? Even at his wife's request. Right? The most high God, it was intentional the most high God didn't do that. Because now it works out for a testimony. Watch this. Grab um grab Genesis chapter uh twenty one. It's Genesis chapter twenty one. Verse 9. Right? Abraham, from his point of view, is like, well, I didn't know it was wrong. <laughs> hey, all right, boy. Word being preached. Find somewhere to sit down or get out. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which he had born unto Abraham, mocking. So Hagar was the woman that, that had Abraham's baby, right, at Sarah's request. And so she saw her, and then what happened? When she had born unto Abraham, mocking. So yep. she was mocking her, she felt. That's why she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. Right? So after that, she was like, she mocking? Right? Because... Sarah, she regretted it afterwards. She was like, yeah, go ahead and go into my servant. Sarah's, Sarah's choice. She was like, go ahead and go into my servant, and you can have a son through her, right? Because they were trying to make God's plan happen. They was like, okay, we got to figure this thing out. I know I can't have a baby. You can't have a baby. I got an idea. If we try to have a baby with the servant, maybe that's how she can have a baby. So maybe that's how we're going to make this thing happen. So that was Sarah's idea. Abraham was like, all right, let's do it. He did it. She actually got pregnant. She had a baby. Now, Sarah was looking like, after she had the baby, she was like, she making fun of me. You think I'm stupid. Right? She started getting jealous, like, looking like, are you serious? Nah, you got to get your butt out of here. So he cast, she cast the bondwoman out of here. He was like, nah, get her butt out of here. Boy, watch what uh, Abraham do. Cast out this bondwoman and her son. Right? Let's see how Abraham was like, nah, that's my son. You know what I'm saying? This is my house. You ain't about to be telling me. You a woman. God gave you. I run the house. You ain't no. Let me see. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Mm -hmm. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in your sight. Most like God came life. to it, you better get over it. He said, you better get over that thing. He said, don't let that thing be grievous in your sight. What did he say to her after that? Because of the lad. Uh -huh. Because of your bondwoman. Uh -huh. And all that Sarah has said unto you. He said, everything that Sarah has said unto you. Listen to her voice. For in it, it say, for in listen. Hearken unto her voice. That thing say, hearken unto her voice. He said, you better, you better pay attention to everything she said. You do it just like she said do it. Most High God told him that. He said, you better listen to your darn white boy. What's wrong with you? Because it was right. The Most High God had to take that. He took the situation that they came up with and this plan they came up with to try to make God's plan happen. He had to take that and teach him. Right? He had to say, no, 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 no. Listen to your wife. Right? That's where they're supposed to be out of there. The boy was never supposed to come into fruition. That's not how I planned it. He's not supposed to be an heir with Isaac. Your wife is right. Get him out of there. Right? 
And so that's exactly what happened. He kicked them out. Watch. Keep going. For I and Isaac shall your seed be called. Uh-huh. And also the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is your seed. Right? So you see that through this, the Most High God had to teach him. He took that situation. Most High God looked at it, didn't reveal all the information to him, but then he still came back and taught him because Abraham was a faithful man. Most High God knew if I tell him to do it, he'll do it. I can work with that. He said, I'll teach you. No, nah, that's not how I want you to do it. Let me teach you after that. That's how the Most High God works, right? Grab, uh, grab uh, Titus chapter 2. Let me try to wrap it up. It's Titus chapter 2, verse 11. So you understand what grace is. It's tighter, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. All right, we look at this, and we want we want to be clear and make sure we understand what grace is. A lot of times, you get the idea that grace is a license to sin. Yeah, but for sure, that's what they think. But we want to you. We have to make sure that we connect to what they actually believe. You know what I'm saying? I don't think they walk around with a conscious thought saying that grace is a license to sin. That's what it ends up being in a literal sense. But to convince themselves of it and to convince themselves of a lie, they're looking at grace as this is God's goodness that even though I'm unworthy of his goodness, he still loves me or he still will allow me to get into the kingdom. He still allows me to operate and be and be and be loved by him and things like that. That's how they look at grace, even though I'm unworthy, even though I sin, and even though I'm a sinner, God still accepts me. Right. And they look at that as grace. But you can't find that in the book. You can definitely find that the most high God died for sinners. Absolutely. Because everybody is a sinner. So he did die for sinners. I'm not I'm not saying that at all. But he is not dying or did he, he did not die for people to never stop sinning. Right. He died for sinners with the con condition that they will stop sinning. Right. Paul even said it himself. He said, it is true that the most high God died for sinners of which I am chief, right? I'm the highest of sinners. I'm the worst sinner is what he is trying to say, right? So that's book, right? But he did not continue to sin. And that's the condition that the most high God gave us. So when we look at grace, it has to be something that takes us from a sinner to, a rep to repentance. And that's what we're about to read right now. This is Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation. So has understand, to all men. there's a lot of different <coughs> definitions for grace. You can define grace however you want to define grace. Some people define grace as like a grace period on their phone, right? It's just like we talk about all the time. You you get a Bible study. It's a different type of Bible study. You get like one of these Christian Bible studies together. You set everybody in a room and you say, "What's grace to you?" Well, yeah. So grace. I mean, there's a grace on my Sprint bill. There's a grace period. And it's saying that even though I didn't pay my bill, I can still talk on it for this amount of time. That's what God is to me. Even though I continue to sin, I can still whatever. Right? The other people will be like, Grace, well, Grace is just beauty. Right? Just like an ice skater. When she's skating, she has a graceful backspin or whatever. I don't know. Right? She has a graceful, she's graceful on the, on the, on the skates. Right? And so that's the beauty of God. Beauty is God is just graceful to me. He's beautiful. Right? And so you have all these different definitions. So there's you can look at grace and you can say, yeah, that's grace. And technically that's grace to the sprint bill. All that, all that's grace. But listen to what Titus is telling us. He's very specific. Watch this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He said, not just the grace of God, the grace of God that brings salvation. I'm talking about a specific grace here. This is great. If you want to be saved, this is the grace I'm talking about. When we start in the beginning, we say, by faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I mean, what is it? Salvation is obtained by grace, not of, what is it? By grace through faith. By grace through faith. There we go. By grace through faith, not of works. This is the grace he's talking about. Right? It has to, the one that brings salvation 
it's appeared unto all men. Talking about Yahushua, right? Let's hear about it next. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So the grace that brings salvation is teaching us godliness. Right? That is grace. It has to teach us. It has to move us somewhere. It can't just be, God just accepts me. Come as you are. That's a lie. You ain't never seen nothing in the book that says, come as you are. It's never told you anything like that. It's always going to tell you to come out of what you in. It's always going to tell you to change. It's always going to tell you to, 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 to change your position and be what he called you to be. Right? Real quick, go to, uh, you know they love this one. Go, go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I don't think we ever broke this one down before. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. I thought you were going to go to John 3.16. All right, we definitely, we can tow that thing up. That thing always good. We can do it again, though. You know what I'm saying? We can tow that thing up. They make a darn mess out of John 3.16. They ain't going to read nothing after it, though. I think it'll light they butt up. I appreciate God for that, too. He don't, leave, he don't ever leave himself without a witness. Take that one little verse and just do cartwheels with it. This is a, this is a Second Corinthians chapter twelve verse one. It is not expedient for me. Expedient doubtless, just means appropriate, right? He doubt, says it's not it's not appropriate for me. Doubtless to glory. Mm -hmm. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Mm -hmm. This is Paul saying it really ain't appropriate for me to be sitting here and bragging, right? But he said I'm gonna tell y'all about some visions, some visions that the Most High God gave me, right? Let's see. I knew a man in the Messiah above 14 years ago. Uh huh. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. Mm -hmm. God knows. Right? He says, so in other words, I knew a man, and I was in a vision, and I can't tell if I was in the body or if I was outside the body. I can't tell if I was right here and I was really there or if I was like just having a vision outside of my body. Right? Let's see. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Uh huh. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Uh huh. Of such a one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Right. So he says, I will I'll brag about this. But he said, myself, I'm not going to brag. Only my infirmities. Watch what he say next. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. Uh huh. For I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me Maybe above that which he sees my phone me to be, my or that he hears of me. Uh huh. So well, one more time. For though I would desire the glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seems me to be, uh huh, or that he hears of me, uh huh. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I, should exalt, lest I should be exalted above measure. So look at what God did, according to Paul. Paul said, I got some real nice visions. I mean, I got to saw, I went to the third heaven, and I saw paradise, and I saw some crazy stuff. But he said, in response to that, the Most High God sent the work of Satan to buffet me. In other words, to strike me, right? So he's saying that now he has to deal with weaknesses because of what he saw because he feels that if he would have just saw that as is it may have caused him to be exalted it may have caused him the people to look at him and be like you know what Paul's the man which may have put him in the position where he had pride in himself <coughs> right so he says so in turn the most high God sent somebody to, to him to humble him he sent I mean he sent um, uh, Satan against him to humble him Right. So now he has to deal with a whole bunch of adversity and go through a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of people don't respect him. They don't mess with him because it has to balance him is how he's looking at it. Still to this day, they don't mess with him. Either. They don't mess with him. Right. So he said he had to do that. Otherwise, you know what I'm saying? He might be exalted too high. Right. Watch what he say next. For this thing, I besought the Lord three times that I might that it might depart from me. So he asking God, he's like, man, please get Satan away from me. All right, let him leave me alone, please. Three times he said. And he said unto me, 
My grace is sufficient for you. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. What else? For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Because my strength is made perfect in weakness. Right? You look at that. Christians look at that and be like, you see, God glory, it shines the brightest in my, my own darkness. That's the type of stuff they come up with. Right? But what is he saying there? He's saying, I'm going to bring you from your place, right, of weakness, and I'm going to teach you how to be. Now you rely on my strength. You will rely on my, if I have the car, it's right in front of me, God promised me a car, and I walk in and I get into it, whose strength is that? Your own. That's my own. That wasn't weakness, right? But if I see it and I say, you know what, that car is not mine, how are people going to look at that? Me scared. God gave you the car, just go get it. It's a title right there. Why don't you just take it? Ain't nobody car, ain't nobody around. The title's right there, it's unsigned. Take it. You weak. Right? In your weakness, you'd be like, nah, that's not, I mean, sure, the car's right there, but I who says that's my car? Why somebody gotta tell you, you ain't a boss? A boss just take what they want. All right? Why somebody gotta tell you it's a car with a title <coughs> right there, unsigned title. All you gotta do is sign it. You a boss. Right? That's weak. But we look at it, the most high God said, I can work with that. Right? Man of God or a sinner, whoever, sent, go ahead. Hey, let me sign this for you. This is your car. You can have it. That changes everything. Right? Because now God's strength is shown in that. Right? And now you've obeyed his commandments, which makes you strong. He's teaching you. Right? His grace is sufficient. Because in your weakness, you have his strength. His strength is his commandment, following after his godly. Right? That's what we have to be able to maintain. That's what we have to understand. When he's saying grace, he's not talking about, oh, I'm so weak. I'm a sinner. I can't stop sinning. But that's when God is the strongest. That's a lie. You deny God. You deny godliness at that point if you continue in sin. You're not accepting the teaching. You're, you're rejecting the very thing that was that appeared for salvation for all men, for all women. You rejected it. Right? That's not that's not what he's looking for, and that's not what this is saying to us. Right? Go to uh 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We look at all the things that we suffer through, all the things that we go through as men and women of God. These things are only put in place to humble us, right? To ensure that we're not looking for our own glory. We're looking for the glory of the Most High God. We're looking for God to look at us and say, you know what? Very well done, right? If that's not our goal, then we're going to be off track, right? I mean, we can't answer too quick. Like last night, I answered too quick. Gave an answer about something way too quick. I didn't take time to be like, you know what? I ain't really thought about that subject too much. I can't think of everything in the Bible or what it may say. I just say, you yeah, know, this is what I think it is. Right? It's too quick. We can't do that. The only reason a person would do that is because you want the glory of saying it quick. Right? That's where the danger come in. We got to be able to stop and be like, you know what? Let me make sure we get this right. Everything has to be about getting it right. Got to be about getting it right. Otherwise, how could the Most High God look at us and say, you know what? Well done. How could he look at our children and be like, your daddy did everything that I commanded him to do? Grab, uh, it's uh, 2 Thessalonians verse 1, I mean chapter 1, verse 3. Watch what he say here. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience. Uh-huh. Pure that, conscience. That without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Uh-huh. Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. Uh-huh. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, in your mother Eunice. That's first Thessalonians or second? Second. What verse 5 say? When I call to remember the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, 
and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded. Go to First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter one, verse three. What was I reading? I don't know. Bro, I'm not tripping. Hold on. Oh, man, I was in Timothy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, second Thessalonians was. <laughs> we got it now. <laughs> Back there, sleep. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me. Because that your faith grows exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all towards each other abound. Watch what you say here. So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience uh -huh. and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations. He said in all your persecutions and tribulations. All right. This is normal for us. Right. This has it, we have to go through stuff. We have to because that's the most high God teaching us and at the same time testing us. We have to come through the fire to get all the impurity out. Sometimes it's people around in the group. Somebody got to somebody got to leave. Right. Somebody got to leave. Everybody got to get put through the same thing so that somebody can react to it in a way that's not of God. That's how I go. Right. He got to purify the whole group. He got this whole group of Hebrew and Gentiles. They all going. They all trying to get into the kingdom. Somebody going to have to give it up. Right. Not everybody going to get in. So we put up the pressure. Right? Stuff going to happen. Sin going to break out. All types of stuff going to happen. Who going to stick around though? Who going to stay on the word? Who going to stay committed to the word after everything is said and done? Not everybody. Right? That's what we look at. That's what we're here for. To make sure that no matter what happens, we can either stay consistent with the word or make the proper corrections to be on the word. Either one. No pride involved. That stuff will send you to hell. Keep going. Watch what he say next. Which is a manifest token of righteousness, judgment of God. Right? He said that's a manifest token. I mean, he said that's an obvious, a, a token is like uh, evidence. Right? So he said that's obvious evidence. Right? Obvious evidence. Keep going. Of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. That ye may be you what? Count it worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. He said the stuff you're suffering for is going to end up being a token, an obvious piece of evidence that you are worthy of the kingdom of God. <coughs> a lot of people will kind of look at grace and say, oh, grace, see, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. That's how you know you're talking about the wrong darn grace. You're talking about the wrong thing. Everything about God, you got to be worthy for this. Worthy is worth, right? You have to be worth it, right? Most of God ain't just taking anything. I tell you, he ain't taking this come as you are stuff. That's not book. The whole book can tell you you have to be worthy. How are you worthy? You got to obey. That's the only way. Otherwise, you're not worthy, right? Grab, uh, we'll get up out of here after this one. Go ahead, grab uh, Luke chapter 20. This is Luke chapter 20. It's out of Yahushua's mouth himself. Luke chapter 20, verse 27. I'll prove to y'all, you have to be worthy. Paul just said, you want to walk worthy. You know what I'm saying? He said, it's, it's, it's a manifest token that you will walk worthy. Right? Yahushua said it a little bit differently. Luke 21. It's Luke 20, chapter 27. Verse 27. Verse 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him. Uh-huh. Saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if any man's brother die having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Uh-huh. There were therefore seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her to wife, and he died childless. 
And the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? Uh huh. For seven had her to wife. All right, so they looking at it, they like, it's a real question now. Our law say, a man died without children, he got a brother, next to kin, you know, to raise ki- children up for him. That's law, right? So they ask the question, if seven brothers go through this, and they all die at the end of it, and none of them got children, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? If everybody's supposed to resurrect, tell me whose wife she's going to be in the resurrection. Watch what y'all sure say. The children of this world marry the and are given The children of this world marry and are given into marriage. Well, watch this. But they which shall be accounted worthy to they obtain that world. They which are what? Shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. He said they that which are account shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. Notice what he's saying. You have to be worthy. Right? This is not like a lot of people, this is a free gift from God, this, that, and other. Free don't mean that you ain't got to do nothing to get it. They can offer free ice cream right now. You still going to have to get in your car and you have to get there. And you have to get there by a certain time before they run out. Free just means that you don't have to pay currency for it. Right? You still going to have to get it. You still going to have to stand in line. There's a whole lot of other people trying to get that free ice cream too. Right? There's still requirements. Just because something free don't mean everything off a window. Just because something free don't mean I can go in there and get as many scoops of ice cream as I want. They're going to give you one free cup of ice cream. It's always stipulations. It's always something to it. That's how most I got is too. Yeah, I think it's a free gift. That's fact. I think it's a free gift. You have to be a stop. You have to stop sending though. You for sure going to have to stop sending. Right? You can't pay for it for sure. You for sure gonna have to stop sending though. You don't stop sending, you done. Right? Because you won't be worthy of the calling. You won't be worthy to obtain that world. You ain't worthy to obtain that world. That makes you a sinner and that means you're going to hell. Alright? Any questions?